what's going on guys welcome back to another breakdown here we go again we got a bb passage from the blueprint fl free exam all right i'm going to be showing you guys exactly how to read through this passage i'm going to show you guys where to highlight i'm going to show you guys how to pick the best answer choice and i'm going to show you guys exactly how to make the mcat easy okay if you guys want to have those big jumps in your scores you know those five six seven jumps you know on your fl scores you have to make the mcat easy okay for those of you that don't know me my name is eric i'm on a mission to make sure that this mcat is as easy as possible for you guys because i have something against the mcat okay i don't think it should be that much you know but that's my personal thing but anyways i'm gonna be breaking this down and before i break it down guys make sure you do the passage on your own first and do the questions on your own first okay so I'm going to be scrolling through this passage, pause it whenever you need to, read through the whole thing, okay, and pick the answers to the questions and write them down on a separate sheet of paper or, you know, log into Blueprint and, you know, try to pick your answers from there. Okay, so this is question 11. This is question 12. Question 13. Question 14. Question 15. And that is it. So pause it whenever you need to. It's time to break this down. Sip of water. All right, here we go. A woman began canning her own jams as a hobby. <laughs> okay, I mean, I don't know. I think that's a hobby, whatever, <laughs> have fun. Oh, also guys, the pace that I go through this is the pace that you should be going at too. It's not crazy fast, all right, and it's not crazy slow. It's a pace where you would be reading a book, just like your regular book. All right, but a little slower, a little slower to make sure you understand all the details. Okay, so start over. A woman began canning her own jams as a hobby. She shared several cans of her jam with her mother for lunch. The next day, her mother was found suffering from blurry vision, difficulty swallowing, and troubled breathing. Oh, no. <laughs> wow, okay. Given the quick progression of symptoms associated with the new food, the ER physician suspected botulism poisoning. Okay, botulism poisoning. Due to the danger and toxicity of botulism, tests were performed immediately to determine the best course of treatment. Okay, not much to highlight here for this passage. I mean, for this paragraph, it's pretty introductory, nothing too crazy. All right. The botulinum toxin is a neurotoxin produced by the bacterium Clostridium botulinum. Botulism is a life-threatening illness in humans, although forms of the toxin are used for various cosmetic and medical procedures. The eight distinct toxin types are diagnosed A to H. The botulinum toxin protein is a two-chain polypeptide with a 100 kilodalton heavy chain joined by a disulfide bomb to a 50 kilodalton light chain. All right, I'm going to highlight this part because it involves my content review, okay? I should know for my content what a disulfide bond is. I should know what a heavy and light chain are. I should know, you know, basically how this protein would look like in my head. Okay. This light chain is a protease that attacks one of the fusion proteins at a neuromuscular junction, preventing vesicles from anchoring to the membrane to release acetylcholine. Okay. This is important. All right. It attacks the fusion protein, the snare protein at the neuromuscular junction okay you should know what the neuromuscular junction is you should know what happens at the neuromuscular junction you should know what the point of vesicles are in the neuromuscular junction okay and this prevents the anchoring to release acetylcholine okay you should know what acetylcholine does all right so i'm just highlighting what's basically my content review just things that i could look at quick to kind of remember and make notes in my head all right but this is pretty pretty simple here okay and then they give you a figure so do not look at the figure. I only look at the figure when the question asks for it. All right. You don't want to waste time analyzing the figure. You read the caption. Mechanism of neuromuscular blockade by botulinum toxin. Okay, cool. Tests employed to detect botulism include brain scans and nerve conduction tests. Toxicity testing of serum specimens, wound tissue cultures, and stool specimen cultures are the best methods for identifying botulism, though they are time-consuming. If the symptoms are diagnosed early, treatment can reduce fatality to less than 20%. A faster way to detect the toxic in humans is using mass spectrometry. Okay, 
I'm just going to highlight that just to remember the fastest way to detect the toxin is mass spectrometry. All right, very simple passage, guys. I would say this is probably one of the easier passages, okay? In the MCAT, you're going to get easy passages. You're going to get hard passages. It doesn't matter. You treat them the same. You go at them the same, okay? This passage, how do I feel about this passage? Do I feel amazingly confident or do I feel all right, good about it? I feel pretty, pretty confident. I would say almost amazingly confident. This is a very simple passage, guys. Let's just bang right through this, okay? What is a likely neurological symptom caused by the toxin's effect on acetylcholine release? Okay, you should know exactly what happens in neuromuscular junction. You should know what acetylcholine does. Acetylcholine is released from the motor neuron, okay, through the vesicles, you know, the fusion, all this stuff. Acetylcholine is released and it binds to a receptor at the muscle cell, okay? And that receptor, once it binds, acetylcholine is going to allow um, cations to flood in. I believe it's sodium. Sodium is going to flood in and depolarize that muscle cell, okay? And that's going to go ahead, that the um, action potential is going to propagate down. And that's going to tell the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium, okay? So if we have this toxin going on, it's going to block acetylcholine, if we block acetylcholine, we're not going to have contraction, okay? Tetanus. What is tetanus? All right. Tetanus is when it's the summation of your constant, you know, simple twitches of your muscle. You know, you twitch, you flex your muscle, you flex your muscle, you flex your muscle. And when you keep doing that over and over again, your muscle just stays flexed, okay? And that's called tetanus. And it stays flexed for a period of time. It doesn't stay flexed forever, obviously, because your muscle needs to relax. So... There's also a disease, you know, tetanus, the disease. If you look it up, it's people just like random flexing hard and then they can't control it and then they let go. And it's very, very deadly, deadly disease. I don't know if it's deadly, but it's, it's, it's pretty, it has a big effect on it. Okay. So tetanus, in order to have tetanus symptom, you need to be contracting your muscle. We cannot contract the muscle if we don't have acetylcholine. All right. This toxin blocks acetylcholine. If we're blocking acetylcholine, then we will not have contraction and we will not have tetanus. All right. Notice my language here when I do these passages and these questions. It's it's very like, if this is this, then this is this. If this goes up, this goes down. If this goes up, then this correlates with this. If we have contraction, then we have tetanus. If we don't have contraction, we can't have tetanus. It's very... Just like that, like the lingo that I was saying, that's how you kind of have to think for these AMC questions, okay? By thinking like that, what I just told you, it's going to prevent you from overthinking and overanalyzing and, you know, convincing yourself that a question is right. I mean, convincing yourself that an answer choice is right when it's really not, okay? It eliminates a lot of the stress, so think like that. All right, muscle spasms. Again, okay, notice how I'm thinking here. The toxin blocks acetylcholine, Okay. No acetylcholine, no contraction. Muscle spasms, that involves contraction. All right. Therefore, this is not a symptom. Okay. We cannot contract. We can't. We don't have acetylcholine. We can't contract. Flaccid paralysis. This is likely to be a symptom. All right. Paralysis, we can't even contract our muscle. That's exactly what's going on here. The toxin stops us from contracting. Flaccid paralysis equals no contraction. Nausea, I don't see why nausea would even relate to anything. This is a neurological symptom. So 11 to C. I'm very confident in my answer choice. Let's keep going. The easiest method to separate the two subunits of the botulinum protein for subsequent analytical, analytical purposes would be what? Okay. Where did I highlight? Okay, I highlighted to kind of remind me what's going on here. Well, what's going on is that we have a protein and it has a heavy chain joined to a light chain by a disulfide bond. Heavy, light. Those are the units. Those are the subunits of the protein. Heavy, light. Gas chromatography. Would we use gas chromatography to separate these? No, we would not. Okay. But they remember, they want us to know the easiest method here easiest method can we separate them through gas chromatography yeah if we heat up these proteins these heavy big proteins if we heat it up and vaporize it but that's going to be a very high temperature to vaporize it do you know 
amino acids are they're kind of stable okay they have a high boiling point all right look up the boiling point of glutamate all right let's see what glutamate boiling point let's say okay boom look at that all right so we don't have we don't have time for that we don't have time to freaking vaporize all that so this is wrong that's extra work mass spectrometry okay you may be tempted to use mass spectrometry spectrometry okay they did say that here a faster way to detect the toxin in humans is using mass spectrometry that's to detect the toxin they want to know how to separate the toxin okay so can we separate them using mass spectrometry again yeah we might be able to but that involves a lot of work if you remember in mass spectrometry you have to like ionize um the proteins break them up and then put them in through a magnetic field and see the size of like individual parts of this protein okay and by that time when we break it up and ionize it that's we're left with what <laughs> we're left with like tiny particles okay what's that going to do we want to separate the units the subunits okay look at the question guys the question gives you so much information all right so b is wrong thin layer chromatography they don't tell us about polarity if something's nonpolar or polar they don't tell us the um the luent here they don't tell us anything about that they don't tell us whether we use uh cellulose paper they don't tell us anything like that they tell us the sizes only so we're going to go with the sizes thin layer does not help with size okay doesn't help me tell me doesn't tell me anything about sizes and separation through that so we're left with size exclusion chromatography okay and you should know what size exclusion chromatography is you should know that it's the big guys that go through the column first and the little guys stay on top all right so in this case if we use a size exclusion chromatography and we broke up that disulfide bond the 100 kilodalton heavy chain would elute first followed by the 50 kilodalton light chain so the answer is d here which molecule could be used to detect toxin D in the cultures described in the passage? Guys, antibody is your best friend, okay? There is nothing better at detecting a specific protein, a specific molecule, than an antibody. Okay, antibodies are very, very specific. Very, very specific. Think about it. It's an antibody for all these bacteria out there. Very specific. So, antibody is a great answer choice. Phospholipid? No. What, what would that do with anything? Radio label thymine, I mean, that's good for um, if you want to detect some type of DNA or see what happens in DNA. Thymine's only found in DNA, not a protein. Antigen, again, that's not going to help us. An antibody binds to the toxin. The toxin is the antigen. Antibody binds to the toxin. That is our best answer choice, 13 is A. Notice how confident I am at going through these passages, guys. You guys have to be a confident mother beeper okay i don't want to curse i don't want to get demonetized but you guys got to be confident as much as possible all right you deserve this freaking good mcat score you put in the work trust in yourself believe you got this all right which of the following is not a function of the sympathetic nervous system easy stuff guys come on come on you said the mcat's hard where where increased heart rate that obviously is a function of the sympathetic nervous system you should know that pupillary constriction that is not. That is the, yeah. When your sympathetic nervous system is activated, your pupils will dilate to allow more light to come in so you can kind of have this enhanced vision. In quotes, I put enhanced vision, all right? So you kind of say, hey, what's going on here? What's going on here? I need to see everything in case I got to fight or run, okay? So B is the answer choice, okay? Your pupils dilate when your sympathetic nervous system is active. Vasodilation, vasoconstriction. Okay. Wow. They are assholes for this. Okay. I don't like this at all. The answer is B. The B is a better answer choice, but vasodilation, vasoconstriction. Really, guys? Like, really? That's I think that's a little unfair. Because there technically, if you want to get technical, there is vasoconstriction in the sympathetic nervous system. And there is vasodilation in the sympathetic nervous system. Okay. Your sympathetic nervous system will constrict blood to your digestive organs and kidneys in favor 
of pushing that blood towards your skeletal muscles. Okay. And your sympathetic nervous system. Yeah. But I just said, yeah. That's technically what's going to happen. If you want to get very technical about it. I mean. Yeah. Answer is B. I don't like this uh, question at all. But the answer is B. That's the better answer choice. I think it's a little unfair. But whatever. The symptoms of botulinum. I keep <laughs> butchered that. Took 12 to 18 hours to be observed in the patient. How is this best explained? Okay. Growing bacteria produce a toxin. That makes sense. It takes time for the bacteria to grow. And once they grow, they produce the toxin. And when we have that toxin, that's when symptoms arrive. Makes sense. Let's see if there's a better answer. Botulinum toxin is immediately filtered by the kidneys and excreted. Okay. If it was immediately filtered and excreted, that would take way less than 12 to 18 hours. That would even be in our bloodstream to produce symptoms at all. So this is wrong. Okay. Immediately. No, we need time. 12 to 18 hours takes time. Toxins can be absorbed through mucous membranes or respiratory tract. No, because that would produce a quick effect. Okay. The symptoms would be very, very quicker if we did it through this. And how can you think about it? Like, think about it like weed. Like marijuana, okay? When people smoke marijuana, they get higher quicker than if they eat marijuana, if they take in an edible, you know, those little weed brownies, whatever. If somebody eats a weed brownie, it takes longer for them to feel the effects than if they just smoke. If they smoke, they feel it right away. Okay. I don't smoke weed, okay? I just know this information. So C is wrong, all right? If you inhale, the symptoms would be very, very quicker. Most of the toxins are polar and they take time to cross a nuclear membrane. Why? Just because you're polar doesn't mean you have to take 12 to 18 hours to cross a nuclear membrane. Jesus. Okay, this is wrong. Answer is A. And that's it. Okay, cool. Let's see if we're right. All right. Ba Bam. Correct. 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 I'm confident all my answer choices. I know this is correct as well. That's annoying. See, look, people got it wrong here. Only 33% of students got this right. Because I, it's a little unfair, this question. Correct. That's how we do it, guys. If you guys are interested in working one-to-one -one inside MK University with me, guys, you have access to me. You have access to other students. You have access to old AMC exams. You have access to the schedule. You have access to everything that you need for the MK. Okay, if you're interested in working... With that, okay, inside MCAT University, guys, it is honestly an amazing, amazing program, and everyone in there is going to get and hit their target score, okay? I'm going to show you guys a sneak peek of it right now, okay? There's 104 members. You're covered everything. You're covered with question sets, questions in every single chapter, every single subject. You guys are set. You have access to me. Okay, you can DM me, you can do whatever. We have breakdown passage help as well. And all those passages, MCAT wins. You can study with other students, accountability, you know, old MCAT exams, questions. That's everything that you need, guys, is in there. So I recommend you guys go ahead, click on the link in the comment section, fill out the interview. I mean, fill out the questions and schedule an interview with me. I'll see and interview you to see if you're capable of working in MCAT University, see if we're a good fit. And if we are, you're going to join and we're definitely going to hit your target score, guys. So go ahead, fill out that link, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.